Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, beyond the hype. Uh, what can we do about aging minds and brains? And there are a number of things we can do, but there's also quite a bit of hype. We know as we, as we age, uh, many things change, certainly our physical appearance, bodily functions, in our brains. Uh, the first row, by the way, there are, are brains from an older uh, person. Uh, the ventricles are large. Those are those little uh, dark things in the middle. Uh, hold cerebral fly, spinal fluid. There's less brain tissue and many other changes. The bottom row are the, the younger people. Uh, if we look at aging or how aging is perceived in, in uh, the media, uh, I think it really is a matter of the good, the bad, and the ugly. Let's start with the, the funny, but maybe the bad. I'll let you take a look at it. <laughs> Anybody have this experience who's over 60? No. Me, yes. Um, there, there are also um, in the literature, and I'll let you read this, um, many quotes, uh, some of them negative, some of them uh, positive. This is a quote from uh, uh, a journalist about 100 years ago, and uh, it, it's, not pretty pr it's not very pretty, is it, this particular quote? Here's another one for some, from somebody a bit more contemporary and sad in a sense that Chris Everett doesn't want to play tennis anymore because she believes she can only be half as good. But moving from the uh, bad to the good, perhaps, uh, these are three examples of individuals who have uh, aged very well. The uh, top left is... Jack LaLanne. And, and he didn't blow it, I don't think. He, he did say, I can't die, it would ruin my image. And he did die a few months ago, but he had quite an image. Uh, the middle person is Arnold Beckman. And uh, Dr. Beckman lived to 104, and he and his wife were, um, oh, he was quite an impressive scientist, and, and Arnold and his wife uh, Mabel were quite impressive philanthropists uh, over their lifespan. And here another example uh, of, of a physician still practicing at 103. Uh, 103. There are also, if we go to literature, uh, and perhaps uh, movie stars towards the bottom, there are many humorous quotes and more positive quotes, and I, and, and I like all of these. I think the, the one at the bottom is, is a bit racy. Bridget Bardot, it's sad to grow old, but nice to ripen, perhaps. Uh, but if we look in the marketplace, and by the marketplace I mean online these days, there are many products that will help us, purportedly anyway, age successfully. Uh, and they range from uh, uh, various nutritional compounds, such as advertised on the top left and the, and the, the right there, uh, to uh, Nintendo products that'll allow us, again, purportedly, uh, to improve our mind and brain to fitness. And what I'm going to do today is look at a few of those claims. Uh, of course, if we could change our genome, that would be one way to go. And, and I'm looking forward to the new director of our <laughs> Institute for Genomic Biology, Gene Robinson, to help us do that. But not today, not quite yet. So, you know, we're stuck with lifestyle changes. That, that is what we can do today. And the question is, to what extent do different lifestyle changes assist us in uh, living uh, a successful life and uh, successfully aging and so forth? And there are four of them represented here. On the top left, we have a representation of uh, food. There are some foods that tend to be uh, quite healthy, foods high in antioxidants and omega-3s, a little red wine every so often, a glass or two a day. Uh, fitness, uh, a quote from uh, Yellow Submarine, having friends has been shown to be neuroprotective, and even cognitive training. There are a number of uh, programs available on the internet and in the marketplace. But what is the evidence? Uh, I think a lot of the inspiration for, for uh, some of these lifestyle uh, choices that we make comes from animal research, uh, from enriched environments in which the, the uh, toys are changed quite frequently on the top left, to the animal chain, uh, training for the Cirque du Soleil on the top right, these are both from Bill Greeno's lab, to animals raised together to a, to a, a mouse who's had a tough workout and is toweling off now. So, uh, but what about cognitive training? I'll talk about two today. I'll focus on two of these lifestyle choices, uh, staying intellectually engaged or cognitive training and physical exercise. Now, these are three different uh, panels from Nintendo. They offer many products. And uh, office, often the premise is because these products, the various games you might play, will light up uh, the brain as illustrated um, on the top right there, that they must be good for, uh, for maintaining uh, healthy cognition and healthy minds. 
I don't know how many of you saw the article about a year ago. Uh, it was an article on a dead fish showing brain activation. That's a bit much, but as, as, as long as you're alive, there will be brain activation. That doesn't necessarily imply that this will be useful for you and will transfer beyond these games to the real world, to driving longer, uh, living independently, and so forth. So there really isn't a whole lot of evidence. But if that wasn't enough to show you, there, there's even an advanced brain trainer. I don't know how many of you are advanced here. Uh, and if you don't like computers, of course, there are many puzzles. Again, these are claims. But, but what are the data? And I'll just briefly go through uh, a very, a very uh, limited summary of the data. Uh, buyer beware is what I suggest. There, there are a lot of products, uh, but those products don't have a lot of science or data that sit behind them. Pretty much anything we do, you will improve at, but that doesn't mean there'll be transfer of training beyond the games that you play. So if you enjoy the games that are available in these packages, you can spend anywhere from a couple of bucks to $1,000 a year on some of these brain training products, please go right ahead. But don't expect a whole lot of transfer. There isn't a whole lot of evidence there. So we really do need properly conducted research, something in the medical profession called randomized controlled trials. And the research at present is quite sparse. That's the bottom line in terms of cognitive training. Uh, but there are some exceptions, and here are two of them. Uh, the exception on the left-hand side is called a useful field of view. Very simple task, a training task. It is commercially available. I, I have no um, interest in it myself, but it's also a research tool. Uh, the, the way this task works is that you stare straight ahead. The, the, the display is presented very briefly and you determine whether a car or a, or a truck or perhaps a motorcycle has been presented in the center. And simultaneously uh, with that task in the middle, you know, the fo at the fovea where you're foveating or looking, uh, there will be some vehicle that will appear in the periphery and you'll have to detect where it is. And this fairly simple task called the useful field of view has been shown to be related to driving accidents and training on this task has been shown to reduce accident rates among elderly drivers. So some evidence for a, a fairly simple and straightforward task that transfers to something in the real world. The one on the right is, are two different tasks. They're done simultaneously. The one on the top is referred to as a spatial working memory task. As you go from left to right, you have to remember the location of those um, the squares. And every time you get a square, you have to compare its location to the one two back. So it's a fairly challenging task. But simultaneously with that, you get letters. And again, it's a two-back task. And this kind of training protocol has been shown to transfer to what we call fluid intelligence, to measures of fluid intelligence. So two exceptions, but just two out of many. Uh, on the other hand, there is a good deal of research that uses something called a prospective observational epidemiological scheme in which you look at what people do at one period of time and then look at how well they fare sometime later. And uh, in terms of uh, cognitive engagement, looking at what they do would be things like taking classes or reading, learning to play an instrument, learning a new language. And the outcomes of these studies are fairly promising, but this is correlational rather than causative. That is, outcomes such as reduced cognitive decline and even reduced rates of age-associated neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's, reduced rates of about 40%. Pretty impressive, but again, correlational. But what I'd like to move to in the rest of my time is a, uh, is a brief description of the research on physical activity. Well, we know that physical activity is good for our body, reduces the probability of many diseases, including forms of cancer and osteoporosis and hyperactivity and type 2 diabetes. But what about physical activity uh, for short-term effects on our brain and mind? What, what is the evidence there? The tough part, however, with physical activity as represented in these two cartoons, at least the little doggy is getting some exercise. Um, but on the top right, we wouldn't want to get too much exercise, so we better have that escalator going up to the health club. It's tough to get people to exercise, and this is why health clubs often sell 50% more memberships than they can accommodate, because they know you're not going to go. But the way the exercise study, studies get done are represented by these cartoons. Uh, I'm not sure if this is Mr. or Ms. Ms. Centipede, but one of the two on the left-hand side states that walking is the best exercise. And, and usually there's some form of aerobic exercise. And it's compared to some control group. Mr. Gumby didn't, didn't stretch, and look what happened to him, toning and stretching. 
Uh, and, and the kinds of effects that you find in these studies are, uh, this is a, a panel from a, a study that we did a number of years ago, something called a meta-analysis, which is a summary of the literature. And what we found is that across different forms of cognition, which are represented on the bottom of the, the graph there, uh, individuals who exercised anywhere from about three months to one year, about three days a week, improved in all of those aspects of cognition. So fairly broad effects. Uh, we and others have also looked at changes in brain using uh, magnetic resonance imaging and a variety of other neuroimaging techniques. And what we have here is a representation of a slice of the brain, and the little yellow dots represent the hippocampus. Without a hippocampus, uh, some, some of you might have seen the movie Memento, uh, you live in the eternal now. If you want to tattoo your body, you might have a memory, but then that's what happened in the movie. But what we've found, that others have found, is that the size of the hippocampus increases, and those increases are related to improved memory as a function of exercise, and very moderate amounts of exercise. So what have we learned? That's it for the data. Um, I think we've learned that even modest amounts of exercise can have fairly substantial effects on a number of cognitive processes, including memory, attention, and decision-making. The benefits have been observed from a number of labs here at the University of Illinois and throughout the world, uh, from children to older adults, so it's fairly broad. And these cognitive benefits in memory, decision-making, and attention uh, are supported by changes in brain structure and brain function. And all of these data are from human studies. They're also uh, compatible animal studies. And finally, I'm often asked, is there a point of no return in which there are no benefits? And there might indeed be a point of no return, but we don't know where it is. We do know that early Alzheimer's patients, multiple sclerosis patients, and Parkinson's patients also benefit in terms of uh, healthier brain and mind. But of course, there's still much to learn, and you know we have some, um, some very wise uh, folks that have told us, uh, such as Plato, that some of these lifestyle choices are important without any data, quite, quite an accurate introspection. And more recently, an interesting poem from two neuroscientists. It's a fortunate person whose brain is trained early, again and again, and who continues to use it to be sure not to lose it so the brain in old age may not wane. We can think of this as a poetic scientific hypothesis. Thanks.